more hands-on than I've done before. I want to take you through today about data sources and how you find data and how you present data. Um, this is obviously going to be necessary for future essays. It's also how you learn about the economy and so on. Let's take a look. Okay. So, finding and displaying data. Um, and I'm going to show you some data sources and also programs to help you display data. I suppose you all use Excel. No, some of you don't. Okay, most of you use Excel or programs like that to do graphing. Um, but I want to give you a few tips about how to find data, how to present it, um, and a few ideas about what not to do. And one is don't use data sources which are proprietary. In other words, meaning they're ones you've got to pay for or they're ones which have some restricted access. So, for example, there's a couple of very good services. One, I think one called Economagic and a couple of others. They're very good very comprehensive data systems, but if you use them and staff want to check and see where you got the data from, they can't necessarily find that data. You might be able, if you log on, you might get uh, you know, a first user one week free type thing. Well, the staff members already checked that a year ago and they try to log on, they've got to pay to see it. We can imagine what they do, they won't. Okay, so really make sure any data source you use is publicly available and there's plenty of good data sources on economics to do that. So don't use one which requires you to sign up or pay money for, all right? That's a no-no. Uh, your own research at a later stage, fine. Put it in an essay. Whatever you put there won't be taken, taken account of. In fact, probably annoy the staff member. So don't use proprietary data sources. Uh, and that's the main reason. We simply can't access them and verify them for, for a big boy marking an essay. Certainly, did, that's, that's, that's a small no-no because you can still, you've done the work to find the data and we, what we're looking for is you actually putting effort in to, to research a topic. But do not cut and paste images from the web, period. Okay? That is a real no-no for several reasons. One is they look shoddy. If you put an essay in which has got a graph that's been cut and pasted from the web, it's a GIF or a PNG file, the, the resolution is of, might be of the order of 70 dots per inch. Uh, when you print them, when you put them in a document, we see them at 300 dpi. They look like garbage. Okay, and we know you haven't done the work yourself. Somebody else has put that work together. That's the main thing. Just call, if you're, you know, you found a data source, you found somebody's paper somewhere. You like the graph. That looks good. I whack it in my document. You'll lose marks for it. All right. So don't do that. If you see a graph you like, think that's really cool. I like that. I wonder how the person put it together. You then go and do the work yourself and put it together. We get a high resolution image to look at. We can see the effort you've put in and you get a better mark. So even if you see, then by all means, look at graphs on the web, but do not put them in cut and paste. Find where the data came from, do it yourself. That gets your brownie points. And it's also part of the effort of learning how to think about economic issues is able to see how can I find the data. Um, and if you do, if you find something you really can't reproduce, apologise for it, okay? Put it in saying, sorry, I, had to, I couldn't find where this came from. It looks really informative. This is the best I could do, something like that. At least acknowledge, because when you're writing an essay, you're also effectively writing a letter to somebody. Think about it that way. The essay is not something impersonal. What you write is going to be read by another person. How do they react to that? It's an important part of whether you get a good mark or a bad mark. So if you think about if you wrote an essay where you, you basically, you know, whack a few images together uh, and, you, and you're making it easy on yourself, you're making it hard on the recipient, so they're going to mark you down. So definitely, even if you find a source and you can't find anywhere else, acknowledge that in the essay and the staff will say, okay, fair enough, at least they're recognising my situation as the person marking that essay. So that's those are the don'ts. The important do, if you do use a data source, provide what's, you know, the EARL, the that's the, 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 web, the web address. Provide that in your essay. You can do it in several ways. The best way is to make, when you, when you submit an essay as a PDF file, frequently the, that the URL is, is reproduced. So you can simply have like a data source and then you click on the data source word and that takes you to whatever the particular web address might be. But frequently for PDF documents, it doesn't do that. I find this quite annoying. So I, I will write a Word document. And the Word document might have an underlined bit of text saying uh, private debt levels, boom. And in my Word document, I can click on the words private debt levels and bang, Chrome will open up and there's the actual link that I've made. But with a PDF document, unfortunately, frequently, it's just a blue line. Clicking it, nothing happens. 
So check it out yourself. When you when you produce your document, write it in Word or whatever word processing program you use. Produce the PDF file. Load the PDF file yourself and then click on it and see what happens. If nothing happens, you've got no choice but to spell the whole URL out there. And the URL can be 50, 60 characters, all sorts of crazy text. You know what website addresses look like when you look in the address bar in a browser. But if you type that into your, into your PDF document, then the staff member can just select the text, load it, and take a look at it. Okay? So if the, if your PDF doesn't work for storing it as a direct, you know, Link his data on America's trade deficit, for example. You can have that, that can have your link. If it doesn't work, type the actual reference in, which is just a cut and paste job. You go to the, like if I was doing that now, what I'd do is go to a browser or bring up one of my favourite websites, which is the Bank of International Settlements. Uh, and let's say I want to bring up the data on credit, which is again one of my obsessions. Credit to data gaps I don't actually look at. Um, it looks like that's a chart here. Okay. Now, what I've got to do to put that in my document is take a copy of that, bring up Word, which I'll do now. Actually, I'll demonstrate what I'm talking about, but this is the hassle that I don't want you to get caught in by accident. You don't necessarily know this is going to happen. So let's say here's, uh, you know, my essay. Make the text a bit bigger. Pick up the spelling mistake. Okay, so I so said the BIS, which is Bank of International Settlements, says... And I'd go on for further to that. Okay. So let's say um, I want to make that link and I want to be clever about it and say it says that, here's the data, and I make my link here. Is this, this, is this stuff you've all done before, by the way, or am I doing stuff you haven't seen before? Has anybody not done what I'm doing right now to make an essay? Okay. What, what you'll do when you're writing an essay, you push you type the text. If you want to then link that text to a website, then you can type what's the character sequence in Word is Control K. So you hold down, you select the text you want, which I've done here. I'll make that larger so you can see what I'm doing because it's pretty small. Hang on, just I'll just cancel that for a second. Let's make the text larger. Okay. So I've selected the text. I then then hold the Control T and type the letter K, and a window comes up which says Insert hyperlink. You can't actually so. I haven't got this on magnify, unfortunately. That says insert hyperlink. Okay. And then I type the address down here. And then, dang, that is now saved. So if I come here, you notice that the, you can see the windows are saying control click. So I hold the control key down and click. Then I load that window. Okay. And that's cool. And it looks good because you formatted it as, as text rather than the whole world. But let's now save that as a PDF. I'm going to save the document, so I'll back it inside um, my subdirectory for you guys. I've got ridiculously deep subdirectories, so it'll take me a while to do this teaching, undergrad, becoming an economist, um, final lectures it'll do there. So I'll just call this my, my essay doc. Okay, that's now saved. That's the Word document. Now, when you submit an essay, you should submit in PDF format. So I'll print this into PDF. Uh, let's go to my PDF document. I've got to change the printer property so it doesn't crash on me. Print this out. Save it as a PDF. Um, same location. It'll just take me a while to get there. Ah, that's are we? I'll whack in an economic for the heck of it, just like I said, rapidly. So it's now saved. It'll load. Now there's the link. Notice if I click on it, nothing happens. It's just underlined text. Okay. So I don't know why. I've never been able to make PDF do this properly. Some of the programs do take the word link and create a hyperlink for you. This one doesn't. So what I'd have to do instead is type it in, in brackets like so. And don't even worry about this because it's getting in your way, okay? So now if I save the document now, and now if I print it again, I'll just shut that down so I can print to the same location. So I print it back to PDF again. 
I'll make it 02 so you can see the difference. Okay. And now that does nothing. Click on that. I get asked a, a security question. Do you mind, you know, do you mind linking this page? What this does is this, this will now make that particular site safe for any, any time you open it. That's what it's doing here. Click on allow and it goes to the site. Okay. So just check that yourselves first of all. Make sure the link actually works. If you put it in, if it doesn't work, which is most likely going to be the case, write the whole thing out and staff will not count that as part of the word count. All right? It's not going to affect your word count. It's not a word. Okay? If anybody does get really narky about it and they tell you one word over the word limit, say, well, take out the earls. How many earls have I got? See what the word count is. So you'll be safe. So that's, that's the first bit of advice about do provide the source, do provide the earl, and make it something the staff member can actually click on and see. And try to format the graph well. Um, this, is, this, this is the main thing I'll be talking about today is how you format data as well as how you find it and how you format it. So let's take a look at a few da useful data sources. Now here's one of my favourites. Uh, I don't often like the Federal Reserve in America, but I do like this data source called FRED, Federal Reserve Economic Data. They've got a couple of others as well. There's one called Alfred, which is archived, long-term Federal Reserve Economic Data. So there's a whole range of systems all running under FRED. So here's FRED. Let's check FRED out. Here's the home page. Now, it doesn't look any different to any... There's nothing special about the home page when you first come to it, but it's well-designed, very, very well-designed data source. So I'll stick with my usual obsession. I like looking at the level of private debt and credit and what that does to the economy. Let's just type, type in private debt up here and press the Enter key. What Fred does straight away is find series that contain that data. Now, you get too many. There's lots and lots there. So I've got debt, notice what you can see again up here. I wish I had this on expand today. I'm not quite certain how to change that. That's debt private. Okay? So we've broken that down into two words. So debt private, let's actually make it a bit more specific and type in USA. I'm going to add, let's see. Uh, you do click on here, geography. That adds United States of America. So I'm narrowing the data down pretty rapidly. Um, and let's see, um, outstanding domestic private debt securities to GDP for the United States. That sounds okay. Now, it's not exactly a, a sexy, well-formatted graph because it's annual data, but that's produced the graph. Now, to put that into my document, this is, this is where the, the really nicely designed system for, for using um, and working on data. So I can choose download. And I've got a number of options. I'll download the image because this is one time you are, it is okay to save an image from the web and I'll show you why. Choose image. That's now come down here, Fred Graph PNG. That's it. I'm just going to copy that into my document now. What happened there? Hang on. They made the text size too large, I think. Let's see. Ah, I'll change the view a bit small if I can. Oh, that's, a, that's Adobe Acrobat. Pardon me, I meant to be in Word. Okay, here. Yeah. Okay, now if I go across and grab that document using File Manager, which I can do, but that's other work I'm doing at the moment. There's File Explorer. Okay, and there's the essay. In File Explorer... This used to be a really good feature by the... Has anybody who's got Windows 7 or Windows 8? Okay. Windows 10 you're going to hate because Windows 10 took away a really useful feature, and that is when you're working in Windows 8, as soon as you create a subdirectory, it goes into my recent folders file and you can access it. In Windows 10, they decided to improve the feature. So it doesn't do it straight away. It waits for long enough until you stopped using the subdirectory and then it gives you access to it. I find it incredibly frustrating. So you notice I save that in, um, in um, economic. That is not turning up in my recent folders, but fortunately, uh, it turned, what I've downloaded turns in the downloads file. So I click to downloads. I've got to wait a while. I've got a lot of files I haven't taken off my download folder. There it is, Fred Graph 5. I should change the name but I'll, I'll just stick it. I drag that across to here and 
Oh, hang on. Oh, I actually need double clicks. I haven't brought my, my favourite mouse with me today, so I'm playing with hassles with the uh, with the um, keyboard. Okay, now you notice the graph is in there. Now, why I say you shouldn't do PNG files in general, but I'm saying do do it for the Federal Reserve database. It's because down in the corner here, and again, I'll just make this a bit larger so you can see it. Uh, Notice this little thing down here. My f dot r e d slash g slash I think that's two i's l z. Notice that. Now what they've done really clever. That's what's called a short earl. So they've taken the overall length the earl, which points to that particular data source, and the way you've formatted the graph, and it stores it so anybody can type that in and reproduce the data for themselves. So I'm just going to type that into a browser now. Let's make this window smaller. Ah, wrong way. Hang on. Okay, let's just make this a bit smaller. So I bring up a blank browser window and I type that all in. So it's myf.red slash g slash, I think that's two, it's hard to work it out. It looks like two capital I's, I, I, Z, and that's an L, I think. That didn't work. Okay, I haven't got it right. Pardon? The last Oh, thank you. Okay. Great. Number one instead. Let's give that a try. Let's go back. So I'll just... So myf.red slash g slash iiz1. I hope this works. <laughs> ah, okay, that's just that just happens to be that particular set of characters is hard to read. I'm, let's zoom in. I'm really, yeah, it might be a lowercase. Let's see. Uh, that's just a pain. This doesn't normally happen. It's normally an obvious set of characters, but you know, this is hard for the human eye to read. Maybe it's I O Z. Let's give it a try. So, get rid of that window. So myf dot red slash g slash i i z l. One thing they tell you to do in software development is never do demonstrations live. Let's try another graph. That that's a pain. Okay, the, the, which I have to admit I, I wasn't expecting. Let's go back and I'll go back to the website again, and I'll go for let's say un, I'll search for unemployment. And then um, add, uh, say, uh, United States of America. Civilian unemployment rate uh, seasonally adjusted. Let's look at that from 48 to 2018. Okay, there's a long-term trend of America's uh, unemployment rate. Choose download, choose the image, the graph. Down it comes. That'll be Fred Graph 6. Let's go across to downloads where it will now turn up in a minute or two. There's Fred Graph 6. Drag that into my Word document. I'll delete this one because actually I'll leave it there as just an example of what can go wrong. Uh, move it up a bit. Whack this here. And now click on the graph and drag it across. There are other ways to do this, but this is the way that I find fastest. There's the unemployment rate. Okay, it's a nicely formatted graph, as you can see, that it will work for you. And here's another one. Let's try that. So that's now my f.red slash g, which is graph, of course, slash capital I, capital Q, j, j. This better work. I'm having a good time this morning, aren't I? Okay, what the hell's going wrong there? I don't know. <coughs> I'll try saving it. Um, no, I've given up. That's that's a pain. It should work. It has worked for me before. God knows why it's crashed twice. We believe you, sir. Pardon? Believe you believe it. Well, if it does go up, you can tell me Keen tried to do it and he couldn't do it, so it doesn't work, and that'll be okay for getting a sales mark. But it does normally work. Anyway, what you can also do, and let's let's go through this as well, is once you've got that chart here, 
you can download it as a Excel file or a CSV file. Let's go for Excel. Pardon? You've done it? Did it work okay? Yeah. I must have made a mistake in typing it. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's download it as a graph. Here is now unrate.xls. Click on that Excel file. And here you've got the data. Has anybody here not produced a chart in Excel? Anybody not done that? Have you all made charts using Excel? Okay, so I, I just, I'll just quickly quickly show you. I don't actually want to have that uh, the observation date. I was going to call that year or month. I'll just quickly do it because if you've already done it, I'm not going to teach you how to suck eggs. Make a copy of that. Choose insert. Go. For, I'll see what the recommended charts are. Does it do the right sort of chart? Yeah, that, there we go. Unemployment rate. Let's go for that one. Okay. There it is. Take a copy of the chart. Come across to your document and insert the chart. There it is. Hooray. And then uh, to actually give the Earl, there's the series name, unemployment rate. So take a copy of that. Come back to your document. Um and then you know, have your little bit of text. You give your text, and then you put in your Earl there, and then a staff member can click on that and go straight away and see it. So that's that's the basic level of using Fred, and that, even at that level, I think it's great. But what I like about Fred is you can edit the graph in a very sophisticated way, which is why I prefer you to use. Master what I've done there, you can just put the copy of the URL across here, but I'll show you. Let's go for edit the graph. Now, I can add a line to the graph. So what I'm going to add here, I'm going to see if I can find some words. Let's see. I'll try credit and see if I'm lucky. Total consumer credit. Now, let's go for um, um, Let's see. It's not necessarily brilliant in how it first guesses what you want. Um, USA, let's see. Uh, total credit for the private. There we go. That's what I want. So add the data series. Now, first of all, it's going to be a mess because you see what it's done. It's put the data, the data on the same scale, which is not what I wanted. So what you can do is go and choose Edit Lines, or Format, pardon me, and I want to format the second line. So that's line, um, about, sorry, the line two, and I can say put it on the right axis. Okay. Now that's at least you can now see both of them together. But what I want to do now is say, well, let's actually edit the line. So let's go to line two, and what I want to show is the change in that divided by GDP. Uh, I can't actually, if I wanted to put the change in a different, I'd need to add another factor in there to divide by GDP, so I won't, won't try doing that in the lecture. But what I will do is look at the change. <laughs> so I can choose here. Um, let's see. Rather than billions of dollars, percent change from a year ago. That'll do. Not quite what I want, but it'll do. Okay. And I do that, and now notice what I've got. Okay. A chart which has got some interesting, uh, I'll just shut down the formatting window there. And now let's just copy, ah, now it doesn't appear to have done much particular to change the URL itself. But if I download, let's just try downloading the image again and see if I'm lucky. Okay. Why did it come down as a zip file? Let's try download image. Okay, it's Fred P and seven. Okay, take a look at that. Now that's got another. I'm going to. I'll, I'll try my luck for a third time and see if I'm lucky. Let's zoom in a bit. So let's try that one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, don't use capitals. Oh, if I get it wrong, come up and show me what I'm doing wrong. Okay. 
because I, I think I, I didn't quite follow what you mean, but if you write, let's say, MYF, okay, dot RDD, slash G, slash, so IVU, capital IVU, lowercase m. Come, come and show me, because I'm getting something wrong here. You can get it done, it's, it's a brownie point, so. And just shut that one down and start again. Okay. <laughs> no, it didn't. <laughs> That's a different graph. What's that one you? Pardon? Oh, is it? Hang on a second. How weird. There's something going wrong there because that should actually, that, that Earl should take you straight to the spot that I had beforehand. It's, I'm going to try once more because this has worked every other damn time I've done it except today. So what R-E-D slash G slash, that is I-V-U, isn't it? Do anybody, can you all look at it? I-E-V lowercase m. I don't know. Hopefully it's a bug at the site and I'll get it sorted out later today, but it should go straight to the link. Anyway, um, that's at least to show what you did. The data is good. There's lots and lots of data there. Roughly how to search for it. Go and search for, you know, put those tags in there and, and narrow it down to you find what you're after. Uh, and then you can get the graph out of it, which you can use straight into your essay. Okay? So it's okay to use that. It's okay to use that. Okay, that, that shows you've done the research, all right? Even if it doesn't work, okay? It shows you've done the research, and that's the most important thing. So let's go back over here and keep on rolling. So that's the St. Louis Fed, Fred, uh, and it's got data from all over the world, not just the United States. I could pull up the UK's data there quite easily. And the graphs are good, and it gives you the, that's what I was trying to show, it gives you the early go straight there. Uh, another great source, and this is mainly for financial information, at the Bank of International Settlements. And that's it, so let's go and check it out. And this is a data source which has only been developed over the last um, 10 years or so, um, largely courtesy of a, a brilliant non-orthodox thinker called William White, who was their research director, and now a guy called Claudio uh, Claudio Borio has continued on Bill's work. Um, so he's got a whole range of stuff that lets you analyse private debt and government debt and so on. And that's stored under a heading called credit here. Um, but they've also added in private, private non-financial sector debt. You get a, um, a huge data file. Let's see if I can find the data file here. Let's see. Oh, that's, that's how much they actually, that, that's an, a, a paper on it rather than the actual data. Credit to the non-financial sector. Here we go. Now, what you get out of this is an enormous Excel file. That's it here. Let's take a look at it. And you go to what's called the document. That, that's the overall like, uh, front page, if you like. Go to the documentation, and it will show you, this is the, for example, the top series here is quarterly data on debt by emerging markets of the non-financial sector with all lenders in percentage of GDP. Now, let's find this one. Let's actually find the UK inside. It's going to be way down the bottom because it's alphabetical. Oh, boy. Let's search for the UK. That's Hong UK Hungary. Got to, somehow I'm going to get UK. No, that's it. That's in the sub -earl. It's fine. I'll find, try to find great. Doesn't find great. Okay, it's probably using United. Okay, United Kingdom. So here's debt by the United Kingdom for the non-financial sector for all sectors as a percentage of GDP. And if I click on the link there, which is that one, then I get taken to the relevant column, which is this column here. Again, it's hard to see. Let's just make that a bit larger. 
Okay. Percentage of GDP. Now the data, you can't see any data there. The reason being, as you can see, the data series starts in 1940. And they don't have, the Bank of England hasn't published uh, recent data. They've got the historical data, but not recent quarterly data of that frequency. You've got to press the control, hold the control key down. If I hold the control key down and press the down arrow, I go to the first data entry. So there's the ratio. Now let's actually graph that. And it's more complicated to do it because the time series are over here, whereas the data is here. So what I need to do is, first of all, take a copy of the dates. I'm going to take the copy of the dates, create a new spreadsheet, and just whack the dates in there. And then go back to this spreadsheet. Now, where's my data got to? I've, got a, I've, I've gone right over to the A side again. Um, what I'll do is I'll, hang on, go back to the documentation and click on that tab again. We're about to, are we? United, I like the G20 United Kingdom. There we are. Okay. Market value. Ah, oh, that's market value. What a percentage of GDP. Hang on. Demonstrations live are a pain. I should have copied the uh, the uh, data first of all, rather than the dates. That's actually useful to make a mistake like that. You see where it got me. So I'm trying to find that's the one I want. So I click on that. Okay. There we are. That's the one I'm after. So again, control down arrow. There's the data. Take a copy of it. Come over here back to the other one and paste it next door. And that's here. That'll do. And that's uh, private debt to GDP. And I then select the text and choose insert recommended charts. You see what comes up. And there we have private debt to GDP in the UK, which I can then, let's make it larger, so you can see it here. Um, there are various tricks to Excel. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't use Excel for most of my graphing. I use another program, which I regard as superior, but I can show you the basic ideas. You notice the text is quite small there. It helps to hit, if you just go to the, the formatting page, just like in Word itself, you can make all the characters bigger. That's getting a bit ugly, but let's make Make it expand it a bit. Obviously, the vertical axis is fine. It's the horizontal that's a pain. So what you can do is choose to format the um, the axis. If I do that, I get the option to change the units. Uh, and this is one pain about Excel. Notice that the, I'm starting from sometime in 1950 to now. And what Excel is telling me is the minimum value is 35,000, the maximum is 44,000. What the hell does that mean? That's actually the numerical way the data is represented by Excel. It doesn't actually understand dates, as a program should understand dates. It says the numerical value of this year is 35,000, which is how many days it is since, I think, since 1901. Okay? That's where the, the strange numbers come from. So you've got to stuff around a bit to choose the right range. Um, honestly, I don't know it well enough to do it properly, so what I'm going to see if I can do is change a bit here with the labels. Let's see. Label position. Let's see. No. Display units. Yeah, this, this Excel makes this a pain in terms of trying to format those dates. So what I might do is just cheat and just select that bit here. So when I click on it, I get that window. If I click on the window itself, then I can go to the font and make that font smaller. I'm making it larger by accident. Let's go for smaller. And make it small enough that it actually is separated. There are also ways you can change the angles on the chart. So if you, um, let's see if I can spot how to do that. Let's see. Labels, um, next to axis. How much I can do about that? Tick marks. Let's see. Access options, number, that's anything down there. It's doing the date formatting for you of the number. 
I'll leave you to explore that because I could get stuck in trying to work out how to drive a Prego. I don't normally drive if I continue playing with it. But at least it's looking a bit better in terms of the data there. You can also do things like if I click on the series here, um, notice that's got one dot for every year. Um, what I can do is go to format the data series and that's the fill in the line. And I can say no marker, let's see where the marker is. Um, the marker options, I can have no marker, and that gets rid of those dots, okay, which makes it, you don't really need them with this particular chart. Also, the range of the scale over here, that's a bit too large, uh, starting straight from zero. So what I can do is, again, go to the options here and the numbers, and I say labels, whereabouts is it? Access options. Okay, minimum is currently zero. Let's make it a minimum of 100. Okay. So that makes the change rather more obvious over time and things like that. There's much more you can do with an Excel chart, but do some formatting to make it more readable because if you just use the default stuff, it probably it will look shoddy. And it's, again, for your own work, if you, at university, it's not all that vital, but when you go working in a company, if you hand, if you've got a, a boss who's a, a bit of a pain, you hand them a graphic can't read, it comes thrown back in your end tray. Okay? So get used to formatting stuff well. Just to show you the program that I use for that, because I regard it having superior data handling and formatting, this is a program called MathCAD that I use, which is about $1,800 a copy. I haven't, I've stopped buying it because they've made so many bad changes that I, I use the old version rather than the new version, but I can control, pardon? pardon? Uh, I don't know. I couldn't possibly say. You may think otherwise. Um, but what you can do as well, and that's a good point, I think I'll talk about it in a moment, there is a guy, a Russian guy, and I wish he'd get more work done on this, who's produced a thing he calls SMath Studio. So type SMath Studio, and what you will get is a clone of MathCAD, which is free. I've paid some money to help him develop it, but he never seems to get the final touches that I like. Uh, there's some things I want the program to do that this doesn't do, but that is a free version and has all the most of the powers that I've shown you there. So for formatting charts, bringing in data and so on, that's worth having a look at, and that's a freebie. Okay? SMAT Studio. So, okay. And now what I, what, I, what I can actually show you here, what I'm doing with this is... Actually, I'll show you one of my favourite examples of how little mainstream economists know about what they're talking about. Uh, and being able to expose that using data, which is more than I expect you guys to do in your own work, but it's um, just showing you how economists fight wars. Let's see. So I want to find what his name is. His name is Ahanian, O-H-A-N-I-A-N. Okay, here we go. So this is a mainstream economist, and you know that I'm a critic of the mainstream, trying to explain the financial crisis from an economic perspective. Of course, he has to have data in there. So one of the data charts he has is this one. Let's just go over to this page now. So notice that's a graph. And what it, what it says is ratio of bank credit to GDP. And notice what he, what he says looking at it. Well, bank, he said you can't use bank credit to explain the financial crisis. Reason being, yes, it reached a peak and it's down a bit, but... It's much the same level it was back when the crisis began, so there hasn't been much change in bank credit, therefore bank credit plays no role. Okay? That's his logic in the paper. Now, it shows how little mainstream economists know about money because that's not credit, which I define as the, new, the rate of change of debt. Credits, and If I give you a loan, that's credit. Okay? That's a change in the level of debt. But if I've lent you $1,000, you owe me $1,000. That's the level of debt. So the, the, he's looking at the level of debt, thinking it's the rate of change of debt, which it can't possibly be because he's got a ratio of bank credit to GDP of two there. If that was actually new debt, that would mean debt would be growing twice as rapidly as GDP every year. So in year one, it might be 100% of GDP. Year two, it's 200. Year three, it's 400. Year four, it's 800, 1600. That's crazy. It can't be growing that fast. Anybody looking at the data should know that. So what I can do with math with uh, MathCAD, and I'll just rapidly do it, bring up a graph where I show, again, I'll make it a bit larger so you can see what I'm doing. 
And this you can do similarly in SMath Studio. Not necessarily as easily, but it does have the features. So I've written these little functions myself. I'm going to divide private debt of the USA by GDP of the USA. And it's not quite the same chart, same data that Ahanian's using there, but let's just chart that and see what happens. And I, I don't have to use the codes I'm using here, it's just to, my little tricks to format data more successfully, more rapidly. So that's the, this is an array, I've made an array of, um, of, uh, with the dates in one column and the data in another. That's what these X1s and X zeros are about. And if I graph that, then that's long-term version of the same data he's looking at. I'll just cut it down to a smaller range. Let's just go for the last, uh, say, from 1960 to the last date of the data. And you can see that's much the same data he's looking at. Okay. What I'm going to do is look at the rate of change. And he's saying there's nothing, because that hasn't changed much across the financial crisis, it can't explain the financial crisis. So I'm going to take a copy of it and put another data series in, which I'll just call X2, and make this the change in debt every year. And I've used 12 months as my marker for years, so 12, 12 units of change is, is the annual change. And I'll have that in here and put that as a second series. Now, does it tell me anything about the financial crisis? Can it explain the financial crisis? Yes, it can, because what happens is credit goes from 15% of GDP to minus 6. So rather than debt growing at 15% per annum, which is extra demand, it's, it's falling at 6%, which reduces demand. So that's an idea of using data to analyse somebody's argument. Um, but again, um, I don't expect anything that advanced from you guys, but... This is the sort of thing you can do using data, and you're using data to tell a story or to explain an argument that you've got, and that's a very important part of writing a good essay. Um, now, property prices are in there as well. So if you want to look at the housing bubble in the UK and what's happened to it and compare that to housing bubbles in the rest of the world, the data is there. Just recently, they've added consumer price indexes. Now, the, the advantage of the BIS is that it's all in one place. So you can find CPI data from different countries, but if you wanted to compare the inflation rate in Germany to the inflation rate in the UK, it'd be really hard. But the, C, the BIs put them all in one place. There's about 40, 45 countries that have data on property prices, private debt levels, government debt levels, and consumer price indexes. So it's a really useful source. So that's, uh, I'll give you, this will be going up on the website, by the way. So you'll be able to download a copy. And I think I've already put this one here, I have or not. I think I haven't. Okay, well, I'll fix it up uh, later on today. And exchange rates. So it's a fabulous source of data for those 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 data sets. Not as not as accessible as the um, uh, Fred, which is still the most accessible public database, but still pretty good. Bank of England also quite a good data source. And of course, they're going to concentrate on financial issues for the UK. So here's their debt website, and you can find uh, you know. Stats on, hang on, just accept the cookies here. Gross domestic static is in there. Um, money creation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, I won't try to dive down into all the different data sets, but um, let's see. Income and expenditure. Let's say, let's say net public sector debt. Everybody obsesses about that. Let's say central government gross debt. Um, go for the monthly series. Next, so it happens. Take that. That's the last 10 years. How far do they go back? Fair way. Let's go back to 66. View the data. Bang. Okay. So this is one thing which I must say you guys have got the advantage over my generation because this stuff we had to find in, in, in tables, in published documents and type them into spreadsheets and sometimes even hand-drawn on, on graph paper many decades ago. So the accessibility of data 
is much higher now than it was when I did the sort of stuff and when I was sitting where you are. Which is one reason why our expectations of what you're going to do should rise as well, because it is just much more accessible. That's the Bank of England. Um, ONS. Anybody here a fan of the show called Yes Minister? Okay, I know, I know Dom here is. You never seen Yes Minister? Never? You want a comedy break for a while? Yeah. Let's go for it. Uh, let's see. I'm going to get Yes Minister explaining the European Union. Here we go. So why? Ah, that's how they get there. Don't want that one. Here we go. Yes, Minister explains the European Union. European Word Processing Committees at the forthcoming European Word Processing Conference in Brussels. Well, say something. <laughs> yes, Mr. White, sir. Is that all you want to say? Well, Minister, I'm afraid that's the penalty we have to pay for trying to pretend that we're Europeans. Believe me, I fully understand your hostility to Europe. I'm not like you, Humphrey. I'm pro Europe. I'm just anti Brussels. <laughs> I'm both your anti-Europe and pro-Brussels. And as I'm neither pro nor anti-anything, I'm merely a humble vessel into which ministers pour the fruits of their deliberations. But it could well be argued that, given the absurdity of the non European idea, that Brussels is in fact doing its best to defend the indefensible and to make the unworkable work. That is simply not true. I know it's so pompous, but the European idea is our best hope of avoiding narrow national self-interest. That doesn't sound pompous, Minister. Hmm. Really inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, humble vessel. Europe is a community of nations dedicated towards one goal. Oh. <laughs> Maybe show the joke. Oh, Minister. <laughs> no, that's really subjective, dear. It is a game of a for national interests and always wants. Why do you suppose we went in? To strengthen the brotherhood of three Western nations. Really? We went in to screw the French by splitting them off from the German. <laughs> The French go into it then, but to protect their inefficient farmers from commercial competition. It certainly doesn't apply to Germans. No, no, they went to defend themselves of genocide and apply for readmission to the human race. Yeah, that's an appalling citizen. Well, at least the small nations didn't go into it for selfish reasons. Really? Luxembourg's in for the perks. The capital of the EEC, all that foreign money pouring in. Very sensible central locations. With the administration in Brussels and the parliament in Strasbourg. Minister. It's like having the, the House of Commons in Swindon and the civil service in Kettering. <laughs> if this were true, why would the other nations have been trying to get in? Such as? Well, take the Greeks. Actually, I find it difficult to take the Greeks. <laughs> Both reminded as I am about foreigners, as you both well know. <laughs> but what do they want out of it? An olive mountain and a red sea, then they? I just don't <laughs> accept any. Oh, I'm so sorry, Minister. I suppose some of your best friends are Greeks. Huh? <laughs> no, <there's not. laughs> The trouble with Brussels is not internationalism, it's too much bureaucracy. But the bureaucracy is a consequence of the internationalism. Why else would there be an English commissioner with a French director general immediately below him, and an Italian chef de division reporting to the freshman and so on down the line? I agree. It's like the Tower of Babel. I agree. No, it's even worse. It's like the United Nations. I agree. Uh, then I'm perhaps, perhaps, if I may, if you are in fact in agreement. No, no, we're not. <laughs> Brussels is a chef. Do you know what they say about the average common market official? He has the organizing ability of the Italians, the flexibility of the Germans, and the modesty of the French. <laughs> that's topped up by the imagination of the Belgians, the generosity of the Dutch, and the intelligence of the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gravy train. Oh, they mean? live on champagne and caviar, chauffeur driven Mercedes, private aeroplanes. Every one of those officials has got his snout in the trop. Most of them have got their two front trotters in as well. Oh, <laughs> yes, uh, I beg to differ. Brussels is full of busy, hard-working public servants 
to hope you enjoy our lovely exhausting family with tedious entertainment. I don't have the tedious. Working their way through all that smoked salmon. Forcing that all that champagne. <laughs> but in any case, I think you're blaming wrong people. Okay. That's um, the two bureaucrats there are Sir Humphrey Appleby and Bernard. I've forgotten Bernard's last name. And Humphrey Appleby, his whole idea is about is that appearance. He wants to make it look like you've got access to data. But what you actually get is so much stuff, you can't find what you're looking for. And that, I think, is why I think the, the Office of National Statistics was designed by Bernard at the behest of Sir Humphrey Appleby. Because when you try to find something inside that last couple of times I've tried, let's just search for unemployment, which I've just thought I did very successfully in the United States. And see, they're probably going to shoot me down here, and, uh, but I'll type unemployment and see what happens. Oh, that's a graph. I can actually get into it. That's good. Latest release. They've improved things. Latest release, main points, print the statistical bulletin. How do I get the data? Let's see. Where's the, where's the chart gone? Summary numbers. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, okay, finally. That's sort of what I'm after. But you can find information in the ONS, but normally when you put a query in, so many comments terms come back that you can't work out which one you're after. And you've got all these documents about how the data was put together before the data itself. So I'm not particularly fond of the ONS database, but it was better than the last time I used it. The OECD is another major data source. The World Bank, uh, the International Labour Organization, and the European Union. So those are some of the many data sources you can use. So there's a, an absolute cornucopia of data for you out there to put into your charts and to understand arguments that economists are making and so on. So um, it does take a while to get fluent with it. You saw me make a couple of mistakes. It can also be bugs, like I think I found a bug there in that. It's weird. It, just, it worked the last time I tried it. It may well be they've done some updating and it's not working properly at the moment, but that's uh, God knows. Anyway, so, so back to graphing programs. I think Excel's got a really good graphing feature. I, mean, I don't use it much because I work straight in, in MathCAD for most of my work now. But as aspects of Microsoft software go, it's pretty damn good. Uh, I'll just mention SMath Studio to you. And that's to say that's a free package you can download and give, give that a try. Um, and there's open source programs as well. Now, the biggest one, one you should learn, I haven't learned it, okay? I'm just giving you advice that's useful, I think, for your career is one called R. That's just a simple letter, R. The reason is it's evolved out of a range of other programs called things like S and so on beforehand. And R is an enormous, let's just take a look at it, it's an enormous statistical and analytic program. Uh, you have to learn programming to drive it properly, but a lot of what people get jobs in in economics comes out of being proficient now at R. So a lot of businesses say they don't, particularly if you do a mainstream economics course, they really don't want to know what your economic theory is. But they do think if you pass an economics degree, you probably learn how to handle data. And in particular these days, because R is a free program, it's taking over from a whole range of commercial programs. So, for example, a program called MATLAB was one of the major programs for numerical analysis and a whole range of other things as well. And MATLAB cost $2,000 a copy. Now, if you've got to buy 100 people a copy in your organisation, you know, you're talking a couple of hundred thousand dollars or pounds, whereas R is free. So companies, of course, the more features R gets, the more people say use R rather than using MATLAB because it's free. So you can just click on it and download here. And then you can see how friendly this is. It dumps you right in a thing called mirrors and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's not... Uh, there's, there are better ways to access, um, to have access to programs like this than, than what R does. So it is a bit clunky, I find. But let's see. Uh, please prefer your preferred mirror. So there is no faster way. Let's see. R 3.5.1. Uh, I'm trying to find a way to download a, 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 a directly load a, a, um, a Windows version down, but it doesn't seem that I can do that. Unix platforms, Mac. Download R. Okay, go to this one. Let's see. Download R for Windows. Boom. Okay. 
and I want to download the base. Hang on, install R for the first time. I think we've already got it installed in my machine, but I'll try that anyway and see what happens. Download R for 3.5 for Windows. Keep the program. That's kind of, it's almost downloaded already. And then you can install that on your computer and you can use it. And it's a huge program. Programming, it's got capabilities for writing computer programs, for analysing data, for producing graphs, for finding quite complicated graphs and so on. Um, it is something which, if you learn it, you are going to have a skill which is valuable in the workplace. So I'm no great fan of its design, as it happens, but I know that it's being very, very widely used, so that's worth getting hold of. There are other ones as well. Have you heard of what's called open source software? Yeah. Who hasn't? Anybody? Okay, well, open source software is software where the code itself is available as well as the program for free. And you're able to go, and if you are a computer program, you can actually edit and contribute code to expand the capabilities or fix up bugs and stuff like that. And there's several sources for it. One is called SourceForge. That's where my free program goes, which is called Minsky. Um, GitHub is another. Um, I'm My programmer chooses to use SourceForge uh, because he just prefers the features it offers. Apparently SourceForge got hit by a few viruses a while ago and people were getting commercial programs with viruses in them. So a lot of uh, professional people in software development don't like SourceForge, but I still find it effective. GitHub is another. That's what they tend to prefer. Ah, oh, pardon, let's go back up again. Um, so let's go to SourceForge. Wait for it to download. Okay. So, for example, let's say let's say search for graphing software. And here you get a range of different programs that you can download to do graphing. Huge range. And they're all free. Okay. So, I suggest getting in and taking a look at those and seeing if you like any of those more than Excel. Then what you'd be doing is you download the data, you load into this program, you do the graphing there. Okay? And again, you can do a lot of analysis with these programs as well. Excel has some useful and analytic features. You can do correlation coefficients, regression lines, and stuff like that with Excel. It's pretty straightforward. But these may be better. And useful skills. As I say, R is the one which is most dominant right now. These things do change over time, however. So, for example, when I was learning economics... The computer language people learned it was in called Fortran. Anybody heard of Fortran? It's it's pretty it's, people who work in the area know it, but it's pretty much died these days. There's now later versions which are making what's called object oriented. But Fortran was dominant, then C became dominant, then C plus plus, then Java, then Python. All these things are changing, so there's no guarantee what you learn now will be what's popular in 10 or 15 years time. But if you learn how to do coding. That is a skill which will stay with you if you have to change the language in which you code. So in terms of your own career, I would recommend learning how to write computer programs in something which initially is directed at handling data. And at the moment, R is the dominant program that does that. So it's a very useful skill to have. Okay. Now, I um, was supposed to do a formal thing for the university today, but I had a little disturbance happen earlier, so I haven't got that organised. We're supposed to have uh, class feedback on the subject. Uh, or have you seen that about getting a midterm monitoring? You haven't. Okay. I I'll explain late, uh, later, but I had something that disturbed me today, so I haven't got organised for getting that done. Uh, but I'll do that next week. So I'll put a note up on the announcements. We need to appoint class people, class members, as monitors on this subject to collect feedback from the students. But have you done that? Oh, you already done it. That saves me trouble. When did that happen? For this one, is this subject or another subject? Okay. Do you know how? To, do you, I'm going to be an amateur and say, do you know how to organise it yourselves, or you don't? Like I, I was supposed to check it up, but I had a meeting beforehand which uh, got in the way. How we do it next week? Do it next week. I'll put up with that. So let's have an early finish today. And I'll put this up on the web and you can check and see how to download those softwares and so on.